Hey everyone, welcome back to a new episode of the show. I'm Mike Brancatelli, this is Mike Adelic, and today we have a great guest. We have Raphael Lancelotta on the show. Raphael was a part of the 100th episode of this show, the, the after panel discussion at the Good Cinema uh, event from Neurons to Nirvana. Um, and he, he was so great on that episode, I was like, man, I got to talk to this guy more. So I went over to his place and we sat down. And we had just an awesome conversation ranging from a lot of things, uh, drugs, therapy, uh, connection, community, inclusivity, uh, just a, a wide range of, of topics. Raphael's very wise uh, and kind man. Glad to have met him and, and become friends with him. And uh, I think you guys are really going to like this episode a lot. Raphael is a psychotherapist at Innate Path. Innate Path is a cannabis and ketamine uh, psychedelic assisted somatic based uh, therapy clinic he is also the founder and administrator of five hive the five meo dmt uh, forum that is uh, not on facebook you know it's its own thing and i think that's really good people are having really interesting discussions there talking about all things related to five meo dmt so we talk about that too we talk about uh, his work at Innate Path. We talk about the papers that he's published, the research papers. We talk about uh, 5-MeO-DMT, ketamine, cannabis, psychotherapy. Like I said, really, we, we cover a lot of ground here, and it's a really, uh, really nice conversation. Some quick business before we get to the, the show. Uh, if you like this show, please show your support. You know, this podcast uh, has been a passion project of mine. I've sort of treated it like... Um, you know, just just wanted to keep it really raw and true and authentic. As I sort of grow, I have to start thinking about ways to monetize it and things like that. Um, so I, I, I have a couple of sponsors right now. We have Hemp Bombs, we have Synchro, and we have Psychedelics today. Uh, and they're all, you know, sponsors that I believe in, and, and that's why they're there. Uh, so you can get all of that information in the show description, in the show notes. There's, uh, you know, coupon codes and things like that. Navigating Psychedelics is the course by Psychedelics Today. Hemp Bombs is all the hemp-derived CBD uh, products that you can get, and they'll ship to anywhere in the U.S. And, uh, and Synchro has plant-based and ketogenic nutrition products. So all those coupon codes and links are in the show notes and the show description. So check that out. It's all the way at the bottom. Um, but really, the, the, my favorite way of getting support for this show is just if you like this show, just share it. Tell your friends about it subscribe to it. Make sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Shows also on YouTube. Uh, if you want to go a step further, you can leave a, a five-star rating for the show on Apple Podcasts. That really helps out a lot. We have 155 right now, and it's just amazing. If you want to go a step further, you can even leave a review. You can write something nice. I always enjoy those. Uh, and I love connecting with people. So if you have feedback for the show, if you have questions, if you have ideas for guests, if you have any kind of work that you want me to promote, whether it's music or art or anything like that, contact me. I, I love this uh, as a collaborative effort. So message me on Instagram, Mikeadelic underscore podcast or Facebook, uh, Mike Brancatelli or Mikeadelic podcast. And uh, you can go to my website. There's a contact form in the contact tab at the top. Send me an email and I usually respond pretty um, quickly to those. So I love, I love speaking with you guys. So reach out, let me know what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see, if you, you know, whatever. Um, and then if you want to go a step further in your support, we have a Patreon page. You can become a patron of this show for as little as $1 a month, $2 a month, $3 a month, $5, $10, $100, $1,000, $10,000, $1, $10, a million, whatever you want to contribute. I know, you know, that fiat currency sitting in your pocket, those Federal Reserve notes are just annoying the hell out of you. So just get rid of them, throw them my way. Uh, but it really, it really helps, uh, you know, keep this show going. It helps me get new equipment, new software, uh, studio space, things like that. I want to make the show better. And if you like the show, show your support. Go to patreon.com slash Mike Brank. By becoming a patron, you also get exclusive access to the Mikeadelic Inner Sanctum WhatsApp chat group. What's up to the WhatsApp chat group? Thank you to Hell uh, out there in Switzerland. One of my biggest supporters, uh, Zach, Ben, uh, John, um, 
all all of the wonderful people. I always I always like forget because I'm going off the top of my head here. But all of you people in the Inner Sanctum WhatsApp chat group, I love it. The my favorite thing about this group is that it's people from all around the world coming together, and uh, it's a little community there. You know, sharing their stories, uh, trip reports, advice, questions, new you know articles that are coming out, things like that. So check that out. Okay. Uh, without further ado, let's get into this conversation. It's a great one. I hope you guys really enjoy this and uh, and listen to the whole thing. So it's about uh, two hours long, but you guys are used to that from this show. So uh, without further ado, Raphael Lancelotta, everybody. Thanks. Psychedelics are illegal, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third-story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally laid down models of behavior and information processing. They open to us the possibility that everything we know is wrong. We don't need new laws that control our consciousness and rigidly place it in a prison. Cognitive liberty. The fact that as adults, if we're not hurting anybody else, we should have the right to explore the contours of our own consciousness without any mediation or legislation on the part of somebody else. Reject the authority. Authority is a lie. Or is it perception? Information is power. But we have to seize, seize the opportunity. The opportunity. The opportunity. Yeah, I uh, I did one of those big five personality trait test things. Mm-hmm. It's really strange. I feel like I'm – well, my interpretation of my own test is strange because I score like 98% in openness, like 70% in neuroticism, and then like 11% in conscientiousness. <laughs> and then I forget what the other ones were, but it was just like, wow. Is there any hope in improving that? 11%? Totally. There's yeah. always – I mean, the first the first step is having awareness of it. The more we have awareness, then we have some choice to change. Yeah, totally. Is that is that what everything's about? Is just like having awareness and having and knowing, having awareness, creating space, seeing that, and then knowing that you have a choice to make. I think so. I think. I think that as we have more capacity to start paying attention to what's happening, then the choices become more apparent, right? I think, I think oftentimes we're not aware there even is a choice. So, um, and I think that a lot of times that when we're making choices, they're not really based on cognitive processes. They're just based on intuition, right? Right, This just feels like what I need to do. Yeah. Um, so, or something like in it's been an, an ingrained habit, so it's kind of an autopilot or something. Yeah, and I would I would say that you know we we all are living from an autopilot place, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, we need to be running from an autopilot place in order to navigate this complex world. Yeah. Um, but I think that as as we gain more awareness, like our ability to watch the autopilot and be like, oh wait a minute. I notice this autopilot does this cycle over and over again. The more we are able to pay attention to it and notice like what what leads the autopilot down that road, then you know, more choice becomes apparent and then maybe the autopilot adjusts itself. Right, yeah, the knowing about the thinker that watches the observer that watches the thinker that's watching the other observer <laughs> or something like maybe it's not, not that complex but yeah i think just just not having to think so much about it yeah um and i think that that if we feel about it i, I like to use the word like feel about it instead of thinking about it mm. i think if we feel about it then that's where we get start getting more in touch with the intuition and and emotion and I think those things can guide us a little bit better sometimes than our logical minds. Yeah. Do you think that the logical mind has uh, really taken over, taken the stage, center stage, become the the prime player in the show? I think so. I mean, if we look at our society, if we look at Western culture, it's based off of uh, highly logical, rational 
structures. I, I mean, um, you know, our entire system of government is based on logical arguments uh, that either represent people or represent organizations and so on. Um, and largely we regard, um, we regard appeals to emotion as, you know, undesirable or problematic. We, we see, pro, you know, you know, calm down, like, you know, pull yourself together, right? There's yeah, all like these weakness. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. We see emotion as this like, you know, thing to avoid. Um, when a lot of times when the emotion is in balance, it's actually a really great guiding factor. You know, how many times do people say like, oh yeah, I was about to get into a car crash and then I just, you know, something told me to stop at the stop sign or told me to switch lanes and I narrowly missed it. So, um, so I think, you know, and I, I think that if we see other cultures in other parts of the world who maybe have been around longer, I think that they have a little bit more balance between their logical, rational mind and their feeling, their emotion, their, you know, we look at, um, you know, you've, you've talked about going down to, to South America and, and yeah. spending time with tribes down there. You know, they have this really balanced, I, I, my impression is they have this really balanced approach to what is mystery and what is, um, what is known and how to follow the heart. And I think so much, so much heart is brought into those cultures. And I think that, um, you know, we're facing in Western world such a deficit of meaning and such a deficit of connection and so on. Um, you know, I think that if we can learn what are the things that are getting in the way and kind of inhibiting heart connection and inhibiting presence, um, then I think we'll start to see a shift in in our culture. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the the I was with the Shipibo people, um, down in, in the Peruvian Amazon. And they just, they, they, they have this kind of ease about life. Sure. They have problems. They have suffering. They have struggles. You know, they have loved ones that pass and these sorts of things. They have challenges, but they don't live with the constant, you know, sense of maybe like, anxiety or fear about what if this happens or what if that happens or, Oh, we got to make a law so we can protect against this thing or that, you know, this, this, this kind of, um, you know, this, this kind of like weird system that we have, it's, they seem to live with this ease of just like, yeah, if there's a, I don't know, if a snake comes out on the trail while we're walking, just walk around it, you know, or just, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasant, uh, presence, to be around and, and the, the healers they're I mean, they're just so in tune. They're just laughing all the time. Some of the most glorious, just wonderful uh, moments were, were for me walking back after ceremony, leaving the Maloka and looking up at the night sky and just seeing the, the majesty of the stars singing to me brightly and then hearing at the maestra's casa, the sh the shamans just just laughing, you know, laughing away. Oh, did you see those uh, demons coming out of that person in ceremony or whatever they're talking about? You know, but they're they're just having a great time. And then you know, it, it's it's really uh, it's a joy. And they live, you know, like you mentioned, balance. They live in balance. They live in harmony. So you know, we've been, I guess, we've been kind of off that track. Mm -hmm. And I think you're you're somebody. I mean, I know you're somebody. End of sentence. I know you're somebody. <laughs> I know you're a person. I see you. Um, I know you're somebody that that is helping bring balance back to people working with innate path. Can you mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? I know you shared that on the last podcast that we did with the panel, but now we have a little bit more space. Sure. Um, you know, I think my work at Innate Path has been a really amazing journey just to learn the the value of being able to do healing work from the place of intuition and 
to connect with the body and allow the body to really run the process. So much of traditional psychotherapy and even some of the psychedelic assisted modalities that are coming to light are really focused on cognitive aspects, right? They're insight based or, you know, um, there's a lot of conversations about mystical experience, which, you know, there's, there's no debating the, the utility of those types of experiences. But what we're finding is that just a mystical experience doesn't necessarily take away depression or take away anxiety. And, you know, the, you're talking about the ease that, that some of these shamans have and, and these, the Shipibo people have, um, what some of the things that, that I'm observing is what brings that ease is the ability to be with the difficult emotions, to trust, mm. trusting that I have the capacity to feel this. Mm -hmm. I think that in our culture, we, there's this underlying uh, undercurrent that people don't trust that they have the ability to be with these difficult emotions, right? Like I can't be with anxiety. I can't be sad. I can't, I can't, I can't be depressed. So the more that this is fed, it creates a barrier between our personal truth, which oftentimes our personal truth is I'm sad. I'm anxious. I'm scared. Um, and these things come from uh, experiences in childhood or, or earlier in life. And, you know, they kind of just get stored in the body and they just kind of percolate there. And so the work that I see happening at an eight path and that I get to witness and hold space for is people coming back into this balance to where they can start to trust their bodies again. You know, I think we live in a society that is so rationally focused. And why are we so in our heads? It's because we don't trust our bodies. Our bodies aren't safe. We don't, um, I think oftentimes we feel betrayed by our bodies. Um, whether, you know, whether that lack of trust in our bodies comes from a violation, uh, maybe a physical um, assault, uh, maybe, right? Like maybe our bodies shut down or maybe, you know, when we were nervous as kids, you know, our, our bodies made us throw up and that was embarrassing and difficult. Yeah, what about like societal and cultural influences, uh, religion, you know, Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church, maybe, you know, uh, this sort of shame about our bodies, you know, we, Adam and Eve were naked in the garden, oh my God, uh, terrible, you know, this, this, this shame that's been inculcated for years and years and decades of generations, and then, you know, even the sort of mixed messaging we see in the culture where... You know, it's uh, women are sluts if they sleep around and, you know, all this stuff. But then we see this hyper-sexualized, uh, you know, music and movies and hyper-graphic violence and things like this. And and also with, um, you know, pornography and, th and these sorts of things. So it's like we're living in conflict, right? They're all, so they're all forms of violence against our bodies. Yeah. They all deny... You know, I think ultimately our bodies are desiring safety, acceptance, love, um, you know, the, the kinds of things that, right? Like sexuality is such a beautiful opportunity to connect with someone, to slow down, to really see someone else, um, you know, and the same thing goes with, with brotherly connections and friendships, right? I mean, I mean just a friendship can be so beautiful and so gratifying and can provide us with these things. But then, you know, we, um, our, our society puts these limitations on, you know, what is acceptable, what's not acceptable. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, kind of creating a little bit of a bridge to the, the growing of this acceptance of, of being queer, right? Like, you know, I think psychedelics are queer. Um, and also what a gift, you know, as I think as our culture has begun to accept um, LGBTQIA uh, 
identify people. Oh, wait, people. that's new for me. Can you explain the IA? Uh, so I is intersex, I believe. Okay. I could okay. be wrong. Um, and A is, I think it's asexual. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I could be wrong. So if I'm right. wrong, please correct me. Um, yeah. but I, I, I'm trying, I could, I could just edit it out and then yeah. dub your voice over. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to be, I want to, you know, I think the idea here is right. Like we want to be as inclusive. Totally. Um, and I think there's even a few more letters, right? Like, uh, so PK, right? For poly and kink. Right. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so right. Or like, maybe like D for like dominatrix sure, or something. Yeah. yeah. So I think, um, so I think that, um, these, there's a challenge that's happening, right? Where it's like, we're challenging what it means to connect with one another. We're challenging what it means to love. We're challenging what it means to be in community. Um, and again, I think a big part of that is listening to the body. Like what is the, what is the body telling us? Right. You know, for some people, um, you know, I think the bravery to say, you know, my body wants to be with this person. Um, and that's not what most people think is okay, but I'm going to be true to that. Um, I think, you know, that's in the realm of, of sexuality, but can we even go further than that and start to become friends with our emotions too? Yeah. And I think that that's, um, just kind of, I guess, to bring back around, I think, uh, you know, the work at Innate Path is so much about coming back into trust and coming back into relationship and letting the body lead the way through healing. And, you know, we call that a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down, right? So you have a cognitive therapy is going to be more like the idea is, you know, we change the way that we think and that changes the way that we feel. Um, so the bottom up is actually, if we can be with the way that we feel, the way that we think will naturally change. Yeah. Yeah. The chicken, the chicken or the egg thing there, but I think you're right. Uh, the latter, you know, it's, if we could change the way that we feel, then we can change the way that we think. Well, it's not changing the way that we feel. We're giving ourselves permission to feel what's there. Okay. If we can uh, allow ourselves to feel what is there, then we can then it naturally changes the way we it think. it changes the way we think yeah. okay naturally yeah so well, think about just like one more thing yeah like, so rather than thinking chicken or the egg right because there's a, an, an equity there okay i would challenge that a bit okay. and suggest that the emotional part of our body is much older and wiser than the rational part of our brain right you know so um people who have experienced trauma or are in a stressed state, they're operating in lower levels of their brain, which are the older levels, right? People talk mm. about like the reptilian brain, right? That's the lower levels. Right. Um, the newer parts of the brain are, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex. That's where a lot of the rational, logical stuff happens. Right. So the problems oftentimes are happening because these lower parts are just kind of reacting to stuff. Um, so if we kind of allow for that to finish itself out, if we just allow ourselves to feel the scared, right. Um, rather than jumping into our prefrontal cortex to try to take that away, it doesn't get to finish. So mm -hmm. that, that lower level is just constantly searching for threat and it, it really is more powerful. Yeah. Um, our nervous system is way more powerful than our logic, you know, and, and I think we've lived in a culture that's so enamored by mind over matter. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like our nervous system will sometimes cause us to act in certain ways that we then justify with the mind. Right. Um, you know, or rationalize, you know, like, okay, I'm doing this thing and it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm compulsively vaping nicotine. <laughs> I mean, Hey, I, I quit cigarettes. Right. The body's doing it. You know, it's coming from this lower place, most likely. But my rational mind is saying, it's okay. You're, at least you're not smoking tobacco. Don't worry. But, you know, I'm creating all these rationalizations that make it okay. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, yeah. And, and it's just this, this 
so much of, of what we experience has to do with our environment, right? And the, the mere fact that like our environment can't allow us to be what we want to be, or at least makes it very challenging for a lot of people to be what they want to be. You were talking about this before, uh, you know, I, I can't cry or I can't have space. You know, people are expected in this culture that we live in to just, you know, this society that we live in to go into work every single day and be the same, be the best, be efficient, productive, uh, get things done, hustle and grind, you know, go out there and do it, you know, work hard, mind over matter, you know, all this stuff. But, uh, but we never allow space for people to be people, you know, and, and it's like that, that is just the sign of, of a completely toxic environment, right? So we're trying to uh, clean that up here, you know, you doing your work and me trying to, to share that and spread the messages here and, and everything that we can do. And, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes I fall into like pits of despair, you know, where I'm just like, oh my God, it's just, it's hopeless. We're screwed. Because I see that what the culture puts out there, the people respond to. They want it. They want it. They want the immediate gratification. They want the pleasure. They want the likes. They want the social media stuff. I mean, even I get it, obsessed with it. You know, I posted something before. I'm checking how many likes did I get for that? You know? Right. <laughs> what's, what's going on? Like, how are we going to do this? That's a good question. <laughs> um you know, I, I think that I think that it these are tools that serve a purpose. Um, I think that I think that as we find different ways of connecting, and as we find um, was that a motorcycle or a lawnmower? I think it's this, it's the scooter. Oh, it's a okay. motorized scooter. Motorized that scooter. Okay. Someone. I actually called the police earlier because it was so loud. Oh, yeah? Uh, Are they revving it up? I think so. I, yeah, I mean, they just kind of, they're riding around in circles. <laughs> well, be safe out there, scooter yeah, riders, and be safe. choose a less noisier vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. It's all about choice. It's all about choice. All about choice. You have the power. Sorry, you were saying. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Um, I was saying, you know, I think that as we we can start to come back into balance with like what these tools can do for us to actually have connection. Um, and I think that, you know, you're talking about like, well, you know, how are we going to, to get past this if people are still are so enamored by the machine that we've created? Yeah. Um, and again, I think, I think that if we can start to allow a, ourselves to find the natural pleasure that is present just through connection, through being present, um, mm. that begins to shift our fixation on these, um, these tools, right? I think, um, right, and, and maybe that is a little bit of a parallel with, with addiction of any kind, mm -hmm. um, you know, addiction to anything, right. We find things that, that fulfill a purpose that maybe we can't fulfill in any other way, or we don't know that we can fulfill in other ways. Mm -hmm. So if, um, you know, getting all the likes, um, is a form of validation, right. That either we're not giving ourselves or receiving from other people, um, and I think that as we begin to learn again, how to reconnect with people, how to accept validation from people, how to allow ourselves to be okay with wanting validation from our friends, from yeah. our peers, right? right. Like, yeah. um, from people in our community and also learning how to give that validation to other people. You know, I think that that, begins to be an, uh, a mechanism in itself, right? And I think that's why as one person heals, it, it ripples out into all of the other people that they're in touch with or yeah. all the people that they will be in touch with. Right, right, yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. And like, you know, when I'm, when I'm searching through social media and looking at my likes and shares and those sorts of things for validation, yeah, I guess I'm okay with it because I want to know I'm doing good work. I'm not just post, I'm not posting pictures of my ass, you know, not all the time, 
but uh, it's okay if you are though. <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, it's interesting, and I just uh, I'm I, I'm thinking about what you said before about just uh, inclusivity, and I think you posted something on Instagram uh, earlier today that I was looking at about uh, inclusivity, uh, diversity, and, and and race and uh, privilege and these sorts of things. And, you know, I think that, uh, this is a, this is a really important thing. I mean, without, and even, I think I would argue that like everybody suffers some variation of not being allowed to be themselves and be accepted to some, to some degree. You know, I, I was hanging out with, uh, my friends, they're comedians, uh, two, um, black comedians uh, from uh, New York and they were out here in, in Denver performing and they were talking about some uh, race type stuff. And I was like, I forgot how this came up. And I was like, well, how do you think I feel? I was like, you know, I was like, uh, oh, cause we were talking about the Jersey shore and they're, oh, they're from originally from Newark. So I'm like, well, how do you think I feel? I was like, man, they, I, I, when I, I never wanted to be associated with Italian people, you know, just cause of that stigma of like, Hey, the mafia, forget about it. You know, that sort of thing. And, I just didn't want that. So like, I kind of, I like, I lied actually when I was a kid, I told people I was part Irish and, uh, and native American as well. (laughs) (laughs) I pulled an Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, it was, it's like, I, I have from my, in my life, I can remember so many times being afraid to be myself, being afraid to speak the truth, uh, out of fear of, of ridicule, judgment, criticism, uh, hatred, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, yet I'm, you know, I'm a straight white male. So Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, my voice, unfortunately, you know, right now it's like not the top priority to be heard. And I understand that and that's fine, but uh, it's just, everybody has their story, you know, so we can all, if we can open up, I think if people who are privileged can open up to this, and say, well, okay, sure. Like, be honest with yourself. You felt this to some degree. And uh, hey, slow down, Suzuki. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, you know, if you can open up to some degree and be honest with yourself about acknowledging those times in your life, then surely you can have acceptance for other people who are not in your, uh, you know, that you're not aware of or, you know, that you may not have come in contact with. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, coming to the, the topic of privilege, um, you know, I, I think the most important thing that we can do as people in positions of privilege, number one is to acknowledge the privilege that's there. Uh, number two is to spend time listening to people, to the voices that don't are not privileged, right? Like, can we listen to, um, podcasts that are predominantly African-American or, you know, predominantly Latino. Can we listen to those podcasts and like get a better understanding of what kinds of difficulties are these individuals experiencing? And then how can I help those people, you know, with the, you know, right. Like if we acknowledge the privilege that we have, like how can, how can we say, um, well, let's put this person on stage. How do we give this person an equal voice? Um, And I think create solidarity once again uh, in our culture. And, you know, I think um, the ability to acknowledge what the unfairness that's happened in the past, the unfairness that continues to happen and a genuine desire to be an agent of change. And, you know, I love the term ally in that. Um, how can we be allies to, to everyone that, um, you know, and, and it's not to say that, you know, just because we have privilege doesn't mean that we don't experience, um, oppression. Right. I think, uh, I think everybody experiences different levels of that, right? Like, Oh yeah, sure. You know, yeah. Men have their kinds of oppression, right? Don't cry. You can't have right. emotions. Yeah. Right? Don't like, be a pussy man. Yeah, up. Yeah. Right. There's, there's all kinds of things that men go through. Women go through all kinds of things and, and you know, um, you know, and so there's, that doesn't dis you know, us acknowledging privilege doesn't discount the difficulties that, 
people have had, but there are truly people who have experienced systematic oppression for years right. oh, and yeah. years and years. And yeah. I think that that's where, you know, I think, you know, you saw that thing on, on Instagram and I think, um, I'm loving seeing like more awareness building around owning privilege and, and how, you know, we can use that towards a positive thing. Um, yeah, because it's not, it's not like a thing that, you know, it's like, yeah, you have privilege. You, it's not something that you just like, you you can't just hand it out that it's part of the system. So right. in order to change that system, we acknowledge it and we use it to empower, um, you know, and, and listen and edu- become educated on, mm-hmm. on what's out there, what's going on. Um, and, you know, and, and again, I think it comes to reconnecting with heart, compassion, and, uh, and ultimately love. Yeah. And that's kind of like the, the point that I was trying to make was like, if you could find that part of yourself that has felt that way, I think that that's a good common ground. You know, I could hear people out there saying like, Oh, big deal. So you, you know, you got made fun of cause you're Italian and you know, fat Tony on the Simpsons, uh, you know, portrayed you in a negative light, big deal, cry me a river. But it's like, okay, you know, there's, there's something there, you know, I've, I've been kind of short, you know, so there's, there's these little things, these little things, but I, I can relate to that and say, okay, I have felt this way. Now I can, I can't even imagine magnifying that on this systemic level, generational trauma being passed down from systematic oppression and, and these sorts of things. So it must be really, really tough. And I really, I've felt very passionately recently about the psychedelic uh, scene, you know, if we are to be, uh, if we are to be the sort of leaders in opening the world to a more compassionate and loving and caring place, we should also be the leaders in being, uh, you know, in inclusivity and diversity. I mean, like the psychedelic experience is all about diversity and novelty. So can we replicate that with the representation that we have in, in these fields? And I know that there's people out there that are doing some great work. I had uh, Ismail Ali on the podcast not too long ago mm-hmm. who was talking about this kind of stuff. Really powerful episode. Go back and listen to that. But he's doing some amazing work. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are doing amazing work. But it's really been on my mind because uh, this idea, this you know Robert Anton Wilson idea of reality tunnels, you know, it's like, there's, I was able to like kind of dial into a certain frequency or I was, I, I'm in the privileged position to receive the frequency coming down that says, Hey, Steve jobs at LSD. So maybe you should, Oh, cool. I'll read his biography and then I'll do it. And then I have the ability to get that and go after that. But some kid in, in inner city Detroit doesn't know who Steve jobs is, doesn't know anything about LSD and isn't in the situation to receive that frequency Mm -hmm. that transmission it's been like that almost all day i want to i want to like just yeah yeah i know (laughs) yeah anyway um anyway talking about peace and compassion sorry guys we had to take a break i just had to go murder this guy on a scooter outside (laughs) it's all good we're all one everything's connected there is no death it's all infinite (laughs) Well, so I, I think, so what you're speaking to, you know, the, the idea of how do we bring more inclusivity and compassion, acceptance to psychedelic spaces, um, it, I think it's twofold, right? It's not only having this radical acceptance, but it also means holding a standard. And I think that there has to be a degree of uh, intolerance of you know, bigotry and intolerance of racism and sexism. And, and really like people need, I think, you know, not only do we need to, to say, Hey, come on over, but also say like, you're welcome here and you are protected in these spaces. I think that that's something that, um, that is difficult in psychedelic spaces because when there is, um, conflict, a lot of people equate conflict with, oh, wait, what do you mean? Wait, we're love and light. I mean, you know, why are you bringing negativity here? Um, and I, I think that discourse is not negativity, right? Like you and I can have a disagreement 
Um, and that disagreement can end up in a synthesis, right? Like we can, we can both, we can disagree about something and by having a conversation, maybe I give you new information that you hadn't considered or you give me new information that I hadn't considered. Um, and through that, uh, disagreement, you know, one of us or both of us may walk away and be like, wow, you know, I hadn't seen it that way. And now I have a perspective that allows me to live life in a way that allows me to, to see clearer. Yeah. Right. So I think, you know, I, I think that, um, we're seeing a lot uh, of of those kinds of of discourses starting to emerge in the quote unquote psychedelic community. Right, right. Yeah. Um, How come you said quote unquote? Well, I, I think I know why, but yeah. well, I would argue that there isn't a psychedelic community. Right. It's not like a union. Yeah. It's not a union. I I think that uh, you know I prefer the the larger term. You know, people who use drugs. I mean, mm. it's um. Because, you know, distinguishing psychedelics from other drugs and, you know, we're all human beings. We all use different substances for different reasons. Um, and even within the quote unquote psychedelic community, there's all different kinds of people. You know, you've got you've got deadheads and, you know, that's one whole, you know, the jam band people. We've got the rave scene. We've got... Um, the the psychonauts, you know, we've got um, yeah, the scientists, scientists the researchers, research, the therapists, yeah, yeah, the academics, the professors, right. Yeah. So we've and we have, so we have all really. If you look at it, I mean, they're literally all kinds of people. Yeah, right. I mean, from young, you know, young inquisitive minds to you know, sixty five year old, uh, you know moms and dads and grandparents yeah, yeah. just just being like yeah you know this is what i'm exploring right now this is what i'm experiencing every day i take uh, 10 micrograms of lsd with my coffee in the morning <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so so you know there's such a wide range that i you know there's no way that that per i mean sure they're part of the quote unquote community right if we say that membership it is taking a psychedelic drug. Mm -hmm. But there's no difference from that person who's taking a psychedelic drug for, you know, with their morning coffee and, you know, someone else who does whatever. I don't know. Uh, sniffs you know, coke. Sniffs cocaine or um, uses nitrous or does heroin or uses methamphetamine or uses Adderall. I mean, these are all, we're all human beings. We're all, we all use drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I mean, I think just getting away from stigma in general of drug use, um, you know, we know that some drugs are more harmful than others. Um, but you know, if you look at the scale of harmful drugs, alcohol is number one. Yeah. So, um, and it's the most promoted and encouraged. It's the most, it's legal. It's everywhere. You can get on every street corner. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think if I, I, when I think of, you know, the, the psychedelic community, um, you know, it, it's helpful, I think, to maybe start to find more specific terms. Mm. Like, are we talking about, um, people who are activists who use psychedelics? Are we talking about people who are engaged in the conversation around psychedelics being a part of the Western culture? Right, right. right. I think that when we start to say those things, then we start to be more clear on what we're talking about. Sure. And then membership becomes clearer, right? Like, oh, this is a group of people who are all... Um, wanting to have a certain type of conversation. Right, right, yeah. And then we can start to be like, oh, okay, well, that would include researchers, that would include activists, that would include students, um, you know, academics. And now more and more is starting to thankfully and hopefully include more marginalized voices 
the voices of women, the voices of people of color, um, and Latino voices and, and, you know, indigenous voices, all of those, um, voices that have not been heard and by a field that has been dominated by the privileged white male, uh, middle-aged man stereotype. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, so anyway, kind of a, a soapbox on, on what the culture is, but I think, uh, or what the community is. Yeah, no, good. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Cause in my mind, when I'm saying the community, I guess I'm, I'm referring to the, like the people with the most resources and the sort of leaders in the field, mm-hmm. you know, but, uh, that helps to kind of clarify. I'm going to think about maybe starting to use different terms for that because that mm-hmm. you're right. I mean, you know, there's, there's people, I talk to people who they're like, Oh, you do podcasts on psychedelics. Yeah, man. I trip on mushrooms sometimes. Shit's crazy. That's it. Nothing further than that. So it's like, right. Are they in, are they, right. are they in the quote unquote community? Right. Yeah. I mean, are they adding to the conversation or are they people who use mushrooms? Yeah. Um, which are some people may argue, yes, they are part of the community, right? They use mushrooms. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's helpful to, to start to put together this idea of, you know, who are the members? Who's not? Um, are the entities involved? <laughs> are they in the community? Well, it depends, what do they have to say? It, de- it depends on on how you define entities, <laughs> uh, beings, um, apparitions, visions, uh, things. I guess that you would uh, be discussing in uh, your five uh, meo uh, blog, uh, five hive. Yeah, sorts of things. Well, it, you know, it's really interesting that you know, with five meo DMT, there's there's not really reports of entities. Ah, right. Yeah. Yes, that's the that's the. Uh, I, I've never done five uh, meo. Mm-hmm. Um, I recently spoke to someone that did, and I'm, they I forgot they told me they said uh, it was just like uh, a void. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, uh, maybe maybe we could transition to that because I know you run this uh, website, uh, Five Hive, mm-hmm. and um, as someone who's had, I've had tons of ayahuasca experiences and mushroom experiences, um, you know, several other kinds of experiences, LSD and MDMA and ketamine and I don't know, I'm leaving a couple things out, but. I have not smoked or vaped 5-MeO DMT. DMT. So uh, maybe we could talk about this, the 5-Hive, the 5-MeO DMT. This seems to be something that's kind of coming up more and more. I hear people say, yeah, I did toad or doing toad, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is this is kind of new to me. I'm, I'm sure people would probably be interested in learning about this. Um, so yeah, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start by saying, you know, the, the five hive is, uh, an online forum dedicated to commu- creating community and dialogue around five MEO DMT, uh, just creating a, a source of unbiased information where people can share personal experiences, listen to what other people's experiences have been, um, find various opinions on ways of using it, uh, talk about what are things that can be done to ensure safety if someone is planning on using something You're like that. You're supposed to tase people, right? That's what... <laughs> no. Oh, no. Definitely not oh, tasing. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> no, I've, of course I'm kidding. I saw uh, David uh, Nichols uh, mm-hmm. posted this article the other day about some like traveling toad shaman yeah. who's tasing people to yeah. what is going on with this? So, as, so in the last, I'd say three or four years, there's been, um, a, a mainly it's kind of started with, uh, this man, Octavio Rettig. Mm. He kind of experienced, uh, the toad smoking the toad venom or bufotoxin um, and had a, a big experience and 
kind of took it upon himself to become the prophet of this and has, you know, has been traveling the world kind of quote unquote, turning people on giving it to thousands and thousands of people, um, without a lot of care to, you know, their safety during the session, any form of integration afterwards. Um, and, you know, m- more recently, uh, you know, in addition to him, there was another practitioner, Jerry Sandoval, um, who, so both of them were recently called out in an open letter um, that was signed by uh, researchers, practitioners, community members, um, basically protesting their the the ways that they're uh, approaching that work um you know there have been so many accounts of unethical practices whether it's using a taser or pouring water down people's throats um kicking people uh you know being verbally abusive there you know there's videos of of this happening yeah and i've also heard of somebody else martin ball i think Mm -hmm. is his name um, who for, for someone was telling me that they had an experience with them and he was kind of shouting at them and, and these sorts of things. So is this, this isn't something that is influenced by the experience of, of five MEO DMT, is it? I mean, or what is, what's going on with this? Why are these practices happening like this? It's a good question. I think that it's because they're, Per, their point of view is that they need to make something happen for, for people. Um, they're trying to elicit a very specific kind of experience. So it's kind of like, um, rather than allowing the experience to be whatever it is. Um, you know, I think, uh, in the work that I do as a, a therapist working with altered states and medicine assisted sessions, whatever comes up for my clients is perfect the way that it is. It's part of their process. Um, and what's fascinating is that, you know, not one session is like the other very different things happen in one session to another. And when you allow for whatever is there to happen, it actually doesn't make too much of a difference what medicine people are using. So, um, I think, you know, with what they're doing is I think modeled after the understanding of psychedelics that has been, that has happened in the past, right? If you've read, um, the psychedelic experience, which was, you're familiar with mm-hmm. it, yeah. you know, the Timothy Leary, yeah, Ralph Metzner, Ralph Metzner yeah. uh, book modeled after the Tibetan book of the dead. Right. Mm-hmm. So the whole premise of that book is not, you know, have whatever experience you're going to have. The, the purpose of that book is to give you a very specific kind of experience, which for them, it was like, this is the purpose of LSD, or this is the purpose of psychedelics, right? Is to have this experience. Right, right. So I think the same thing has happened with 5-MeO-DMT, where, um, you know, it has an ability to give a certain type of experience. And there's this assumption that you have to have that kind of experience in order for it to be valuable or useful. So there's this, uh, there's an enamored, quality or, or, you know, an obsession with having the quote unquote breakthrough experience. Right. Yeah. See, actually just, if I could sure, chime in for a second, I just, this is kind of why I, uh, I haven't had these experiences because I knew that I, I should not be desiring the peak experience, so to speak, you know? So my the way that I've gone about it has been, well, if it comes into my situation and I feel ready and there's a call or there's something, I feel ready to receive it, then I'll partake. But uh, after a series of uh, several months of going in heavy with large mushroom ceremonies, I had a mushroom experience. It was like, dude, what are you doing? You know, like, because I really was with this intention of I'm going to I'm going to get the thing, 
Like I'm gonna I'm gonna get the transcendental object at the end of time and I'm gonna bring it back. That's and what I'm gonna solve this. all my it's problems. It's gonna solve all my problems. Like I was go I'm going it's like going on a roller coaster, like I wanna go again. And that was uh that was eye opening for me. So I was like, Okay, well, you know, I'm not gonna seek this out. Uh if it happens to happen, that's where it'll be. And so um but, but yeah, so there's these certain kinds of experiences and they're shaping them this way and, and these sorts of things. And uh, I forgot where you were, were at uh, before. Well, I... Yeah, just saying that I think the reason why you're seeing these very forceful practices that, are, that don't have any regard for the individual is that there's uh, a strong desire to make it a certain way rather than giving space for whatever is there to happen. Um. You know, I, I think that that is, in a way, traumatizing. It takes away people's autonomy and it takes away people's own experience. I think there's so much value in giving someone the gift of their own experience. Right, yeah. And I think that it also really limits, um, you know, the the value that these different drugs can have. I think that... For example, if you look at um, ketamine, for example, a lot of people equate ketamine with K-hole, right? Like the, what ketamine is for is you take a, a big dose of it and you, you know, you kind of dissociate from reality and you lose your body and, and it's like a near-death experience. And there's so much emphasis on that when, um, you know, at, at really low doses, it's actually this incredible tool to um, access subconscious material. You know, we, we work with ketamine at innate path in pretty low doses that a lot of people are like, Oh, well, that's not psychedelic. Um, but it is. Right. Mm. So, um, right. So I think that, you know, the same thing with five MEO DMT, there's this very big emphasis on, Oh, you got to break through, you got to, you know, tr like, transcend your body and merge with be one with the universe. And there's so much emphasis on that where sure. I mean, that kind of experience can be beautiful, you know, incredible, right. Mystical, um, in, 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 in a sense, be the pinnacle of what you can achieve or what you can experience. But that doesn't necessarily mean that having this big luminous experience is going to have a direct impact on you as the human embodied being. Right. So, um, so I think, yeah. So anyway, I, you know, I think that that's number one, why those people have approached it from such a forceful way. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's illuminating the importance of approaching it from a different perspective mm -hmm. where, um, we can just trust that the individual is going to get what they need. Right. Yeah. Rather yeah. than be like, Oh, you didn't get that experience. Well, here, we're going to have to give you even higher dose. Oh, you, you still didn't get the experience. Let's give you even more. Right. And they just keep upping, 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 upping. And right. So you have people, you know, smoking absurd overdoses of, of this material. And, you know, they're still not getting the, the thing that you're trying to force. Right. So, so you keep adding more and more things to try to force this experience. Right. And that's where, you know, and I think that you have people who don't have clinical training with this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, they, they don't have uh, any kind of psychological or clinical background to understand, like, what are the mechanisms that may not be allowing people to have the experience that you're trying to give them or you're trying to f actually force, force them. them. Yeah. Right. Um, when the system feels traumatized, it shuts down. Right. So our, our nervous systems are so powerful that they can abort a trip if they feel threatened. Mm. So, um, so, and you have a lot of people coming to, to experience this, these, you know, substances, medicines, um, you know, people say all the time, right. I went to drink ayahuasca and nothing happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I took mushrooms. They don't work for me, you right. know, 
their system is like, you are not ready for whatever this thing is going to open up for you, or you don't feel safe enough to open up to what this is going to open up for you. Mm -hmm. And so that, that again comes back to this wisdom that our bodies have that really is, has nothing to do with your brain, right? Like you can tell yourself, like, I feel safe. I trust this person, but if your body doesn't, it's not going to go there. Right. Right. So, so I think, um, you know, again, there's like this being able to come at it from a trauma informed perspective to understand like where people are at. Um, and ultimately to, to do work with people over a period of time, rather than thinking that that one session is going to be the be all end all thing. Um, you know, I think these are all things that, you know, I, I think we're seeing it very, uh, in stark contrast, when we look at 5-MeO-DMT, it's a huge debate and it's a huge thing that's showing up now. But if you think about it and you look at other places, I mean, it's existed with all other psychedelics. I mean, yeah. you know, when LSD was first introduced into the Western world, there were very similar people who, you know, got as much LSD as they could and went and traveled and gave it to as many people as they could with this idea that, you know, if enough people have this transcendental experience or, right, yeah. you know, uh, mystical experience, that the world's problems will end. Yeah. Right? If we get, if everyone just gets the transcendental object at the end of time, the world will be a better place. We won't have, we won't have war. We won't have all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The so, Ken Kesey, the Merry Pranksters, yeah. the Electric Kool Aid Acid Test, the Brotherhood. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Orange, orange uh, sunshine makers. Yeah. So you know, there's, um, you know, it's great, right? Like every a lot more people have had this experience, right? Like the Western world is, at the very least, aware that there's something more. But, um, you know, having these super big experiences doesn't necessarily allow for a lot of it to be integrated into here and now. Totally. That's right. what I was thinking when we're talking about these people going around and shocking people or throwing water on them. What are they just traveling into places, giving people toad, 5-MeO-DMT, doing, forcing these things and then leaving? And then w- what are these people left with? How do they, because yeah. at the end of the day, I mean, you know, I guess maybe if you're, I, you could be at any stage in your psychedelic journey. But uh, for me, it was early on in my psychedelic journey when I thought it, it was all about seeing the things. It was all about the the fractals and the sacred geometry and the entity. And while that's all nice and everything, yeah, at the end of the day, we got to come back to this human existence. And then what do you do? So it's like, it's not just about the fireworks show. I think maybe a lot of people get stuck on that. I, I did. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, these people are being left with like, with what? I mean, what? Ha, what they're, ha, they're left with a big phenomenon. Yeah. Right? I just experienced a major event that I have no words for, no con- concept for, nothing. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a big reason why, you know, uh, I created the the Five Hive was like, okay, there. number one, there needs to be a place, not Facebook, where people can go and talk about these things. Yeah. You know, I wanted to give people... Uh, a space off of Facebook where they could have conversations about this. Um, and also to give people like so many people who experience ceremony or, you know, have a session with it and have no real community or support around it um, to be able to have a place that they could go online and be like, Hey, I, I have no idea what this was and having like a whole bunch of people being like, Oh yeah. You know, I, I've experienced that, you know, you're not alone. Right. right? So important. Yeah. Right. And having, you know, even though it's like, that's not a quote unquote normal experience, right? If, if people, more people experienced it, you know, at lower doses or, you know, in, in a different kind of environment, right? Like they might not have these kinds of like super scary integration processes yeah, or super paradigm shattering things where it's like, now I can't function in the world. <laughs> yeah. Right. That happened to me too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you can relate. <laughs> yes, um, I can. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, that's happened with ayahuasca, right? That's happened with, uh, with DMT, you know, the, with in the earlier days of when ayahuasca was be- becoming in vogue, you know, the, they created the ayahuasca forums 
And that was an incredible resource for so many people who like, you know, went and had these big experiences and then were like, Oh my God, I have, there's no one to talk to. Um, you know, we see the DMT nexus is another incredible, uh, resource for mm-hmm. people who are interested in DMT and, you know, these kinds of, of substances. Yeah. So I, you know, I just in, joined in another group way. too called DMT world and they have an app. Yeah. So a little, yeah, I'm a little bit leery of, of that. Group. Timothy. <laughs> Oh yeah, how come? What's going on with there? Uh, it, it's questionable what their motives are. Um, you know. Do you know the person that started it? I, I don't. Oh okay. I don't. Yeah, I actually know very little about it. I mean, me neither. I don't know anything. I just. Yeah, I mean, it's it's odd that, you know, that you'd create a, a social media network for something that's illegal. Um, you know, and so CIA. Who knows? Yeah, I don't maybe. know. But yeah. I, I just, I worry about safety, right? Sure. Like anon- anonymity. Um, I think about, you know, like if it's an app on people's phones, like, um, I don't know. I, and I think like why create something for something that already exists, right? Like the DMT nexus right. is, you know, I, I can't imagine there being a better online community for DMT. So why create DMT world? Anyway, it's a, it's a little bit of a, I think it's a little strange and having talked to some people who have been on the DMT nexus for years, um, you know, they're also kind of like, eh, what, what's going on here? You know, I think when I created the five hive, I got in touch with the, the nexus and was like, Hey, you know, I'm creating this. And there was a lot of support, you know, a lot of people from the nexus were like, Oh, that's really cool that, you know, that there can be conversations about that there. Great. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, I don't know. The DMT world is, is a bit of a strange thing. I, don't know. I saw Dennis McKenna tweeted something out. So uh-huh. I was like, well, if I guess if Dennis is endorsing it, then, you know, but then I don't know. I, uh, yeah, again, it's like my, I guess my, my experiences have been predominantly with ayahuasca. You know, the one time I did smoke DMT, uh, I had this experience where, you know, nothing happened, quote unquote. Uh, but, uh, cause I was really, like I said, expecting that big thing. And, uh, so I just said, okay, well, that's what happened. So, you know, I'll just kind of let it be. I'm not going to chase this thing. Five MEO DMT is fairly new to the party, right? It's, um, hasn't been around for too long. Uh, can you explain a, a little bit about its history? It's, uh, it's developing practices, I guess, outside of some of these more dangerous ones. Um, and then maybe some experiences, uh, if, if you've had them. Um, well, so the five MEO DMT in terms of like being known to the, the chemistry world was first synthesized in like 1936, Oh, but it wasn't until, much later that it was, you know, extracted from a plant. And, um, and even then there wasn't really an understanding of, of what it could do or what it was. Right. Um, I think that connection started to happen when, um, you know, they started looking at different, um, snuffs. And so there's, there's different snuffs that have been, that we know have been used for thousands of years, DMT containing snuffs. Um, so those are the anadenanthra colubrina seeds and the anadenanthra peregrina seeds. Um, I believe it's the colubrina that have more of the 5-MeO DMT and bufotenine. So, um, so that connection was made of like, Oh wait, we can identify this because it's been, we've synthesized it. Um, and then also looking at Varola resin, which was also used in snuffs and the Varola resin is another uh, snuff that that one actually primarily contained five MEO DMT and really not many other things. Mm -hmm. Um, then around, I would say around, I want to say around the late seventies, early eighties, um, there was, you know, I think there was an analysis of the, the Bufo alvarius toad. And if you look at that paper, um, by Andrew Weil 
and Wade Davis. Okay. They basically like got these toads, dried them out and like analyzed the content of like the whole thing, right? They weren't just looking at the, you know, the, uh, the secretion. Right. So they found, uh, many different compounds, but one of the compounds in there was five amino DMT. So interesting. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's unclear exactly, um, who was the first person to smoke, uh, toad secretion, but, um, you know, there was a, a manual that came out, I think like mid to early eighties, mm-hmm. uh, on how to do this. Right. Right. And, um, so then it was kind of more of like an underground, like only for the most, um, experienced and seasoned psychonauts or, you know, hippies and, um, you know, there was, I think, I think the name of the, the guy was a white dog was this person who had like a group that was, that would smoke this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think I remember seeing something on Hamilton's pharmacopoeia yeah, yeah. about this. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there's that. And, um, and then in, in terms of the most recent resurgence of this, yeah. um, so, uh, a group of, you know, the, I guess a group of some hippies from California went down to Mexico and they introduced, you know, these doctors that, that we talked about earlier to the, to smoking the, the toad venom, the toad secretion. And, and it was, you know, majorly popularized at that point. Um, once they tried to create this link between you know, the, the act of smoking it and saying like, Oh, this is an indigenous practice, which there's no evidence for. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's still up for debate, but anyone that I've spoken to from that area who knows the indigenous people have said like, that's never been part of their culture, never been part of their practices. Um, and so there isn't, there isn't an oral history even saying that this is something that's been used. And and with all other, you know, entheogenic medicines, I mean, there's an oral history of it, right? Like ayahuasca has an oral history. San Pedro has an oral history. The use of these uh, DMT containing snuffs has an oral history. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mushrooms. I mean, all of these other uh, substances, medicine, psychedelics, all have an oral history. And this, this doesn't. So, um, so there's something there that's maybe a little weird. Mm. And, you know, I think that as, uh, you know, that really kind of created a big resurgence of it. In the 90s, uh, during the research chemical kind of phase in uh-huh. the United States yeah. where, you know, there were a lot of chemical supply companies creating all kinds of gray area psychedelics. 5-MeO-DMT was one of those um, that I think a lot of people, if you look back on forums, you know, people kind of going and being like, hey, I have this stuff, 5-MeO-DMT, and people being like, oh, yeah, it's just like DMT. And people being like, no, this is the worst, you know, scariest experience of my life, you know, just just horror stories. Um, So it is a dimethyltryptamine. Yeah, it's 5-methoxy it dimethyltryptamine. 5-methoxy, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I think there's a lot of confusion sometimes that happens with that. People, you know, DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, what's the difference? There's NN-DMT yeah. and then 5-MeO-DMT. Yeah, so it's, you know, 5-methoxy NN dimethyltryptamine. Gotcha. Right? So um, the difference between them is 5-MeO-DMT has... Um, a methoxy group. So there's a methyl group with an oxygen at the fifth position on the molecule. So that's really the only difference. Mm-hmm. Um, but even that slight change, you know, it changes the whole experience. Yeah. Cause I, I, I brought up before about the entities. I, I was really just trying to go for a kind of humorous transition, but, uh, <laughs> but there's a huge difference here. So yeah. there's the DMT experience. There's the five DM, uh, five MEO DMT experience. What, what's, 
Can you put it into to words? I mean, could you elicit some kind of a, a feeling? And w- when did you when did you start getting interested in this? Have you always been interested in this? When did this did, when did five meo peak your your interest? So it, it came into interest for me. Uh, I would say about three or four three years ago. Uh, yeah, three about three. Um, so, uh, a friend of mine, you know, was like, oh yeah, you know, I got some 5-MeO DMT. It's, you know, it's the holy grail of psychedelics. And, um, you know, and I, I had heard about it, but, you know, I, I, coming more from the, the online forums world, you know, everything that, that back then, everything that you would read about it was like people didn't find it to be very, you know, they either found it to be terrifying or, you know, like that was an incredible experience, but I'll never do it again. I'm just glad I'm alive. Right? Like that kind of thing. <laughs> right. And so I was like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Yeah. You know, like how can, how can this be the Holy grail or whatever? And, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, I, did a lot of reading about it. I started like, you know, reading more stuff, you know, looking at uh, Tryptamine Palace by James Orrock and Mm -hmm. uh, reading The Toad and the Jaguar by Ralph Metzner and um, delving a little bit more into it, being like, oh, okay, maybe there is something to this. Um, And I didn't really get, uh, you know, that much deeper into it uh, until, uh, or at least, you know, into the, the more like research side of things. Um, one of my close friends died from an overdose of 5-MeO-DMT and, uh, you know, it was done really irresponsibly. You know, he had been drinking alcohol and the person that gave it to him gave him a, a massive overdose of it. Mm. Um, you know, sorry to hear that. Yeah. And I think after that, there was, I felt that, uh, a strong desire to hope to put better information out there um, that, I mean, you know, it's harm reduction information that really applies to any psychedelic. Like you shouldn't be taking a high dose of any psychedelic if you've been drinking copious amounts of alcohol. Right. But, you know, here's this, uh, very powerful substance that was used improperly and resulted in this. Um, and so, yeah, it was around that time that, you know, I, I'd gone back to school. I was in grad school for counseling. Um, you know, I started connecting with researchers about it, um, and, you know, was invited to collaborate on, on a few projects and, you know, kind of from that one collaboration led to another, led to some more. And, you know, I think that that kind of led down that road. And, and as, as I worked on more of these research projects, the popularity of it was growing, which I think um, wasn't really related to the research. It was more related to, I mean, the popularization of it. Right, right. Um, and the creating this notion again of this holy grail of psychedelics. That's how I've heard about it. Yeah. I've heard about it as this, this, this peak experience, this rocket ship to God, this, this crazy thing. And, you know, even down at the ayahuasca center that I was at, you know, we'd sit around after lunch and people telling stories about things that they've done and places they've went and, talking about 5-MEO and, and I'm just like, okay, it's interesting. So I just keep, I just keep hearing more and more about it, you know, and it it is incredibly powerful. Yeah. It's a, it's an incredibly powerful, um, molecule. Um, Why, why should someone do it? Why, why would, what would a, let me see if I could think of a better uh, way to ask this. It's like, what would one, what would be a sort of wise or responsible reason to seek out a 5-MEO experience? 
I think the same question could be asked of any other psychedelic. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, the way that I'm approaching it is more from a, a clinical therapeutic standpoint uh, in terms of therapeutic potential. Yeah, I've seen some good things coming out, uh, good articles being published recently. I forget what the most recent was showing. Uh, was it for depression, was it? or? Yeah, so that was one of the papers that I've co-authored. Oh, I should, um, maybe, that was, maybe that was it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that, you know, those, that series of, of projects was led by Alan Davis out of Johns Hopkins and, um, you know, looking at, uh, we did a survey study looking at a, a large group of people who use, have used 5-MeO-DMT. Um, why 5-MeO-DMT for clinical applications? Um, so in all the research that we've done on it, so we're finding that 5-MeO-DMT produces uh, experiences as powerful as moderate to high doses of psilocybin. Um, it's showing that it has this, this very similar capacities for... Um, you know, reducing symptoms of depression and anxiety, uh, increasing mindfulness capacity, um, doesn't have addictive patterns of use associated with it. And it has a short duration. So when you look at something like psilocybin, which has a lot of those same qualities, you're looking at having to put someone through a, a six hour long experience. Right. So that, that begins to become very expensive. Mm, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, a lot of resources. You're going to have, you need to have, you know, the protocol for psilocybin is you have, you know, two licensed clinicians right. who have to be there for six hours. It's a big time investment with the, the client. Um, you know, and, and it's not just one, you know, typically it's three psilocybin sessions for the, you know, the, the quote unquote treatment. Yeah. And even then, right, there's still maybe some, some more therapeutic work that needs to happen afterwards. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we're looking at 5-MeO-DMT, um, there's the potential for this molecule to be experienced in a shorter period of time. So you know, maybe a two hour long session rather than uh, a six hour long session. Right, right. It's, um, you know, the, the system assimilates it really easily. And um, there's a, a very quick recovery time. So, you know, people kind of have their experience and then they, they come back and, you know, they can, you know, not necessarily uh, drive home, but, you know, they can kind of, go back home and go about their day. It's not like they need to stay overnight at a facility to like, you know, come back down or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so for all those reasons, there's a lot of potential, uh, for this to be much more accessible to people as a medicine for psychedelic assisted therapy compared to, you know, even MDMA or psilocybin, which have a longer duration of action um, require much more resources. Right, right. So it's not to say that it, it fully substitutes for those. I think that, you know, MDMA has its, ben you know, it has its strengths and psilocybin has its strengths. Um, and 5-MeO-DMT is kind of in the middle of a lot of different things where, you know, it, you know, a lot of people talk about having it having, you know, big, um, empathic qualities, transcendent qualities, uh, ability to feel a lot in the body and process somatic stuff. Um, and so because it has a lot of those shared qualities and it has that shorter duration, you know, it's something that may be beneficial, um, as the field progresses. Yeah. So, so I guess, I guess that's, you know, I, I'm coming at it from its use as a therapeutic tool to, to be as used as an adjunct to therapy. Um, 
you know, in terms of its use recreationally or, or for spiritual exploration, um, you know, I, it's, that's not as much like my area of, of like how I would approach it. Um, you know, again, it's, it's an incredibly powerful experience. So it's kind of the, the thing that I would say, wow, it's super important to have a support system around an experience like that, where, you know, people have some kind of support, some kind of plan to integrate or, you know, how is this experience going to fit in to your life, your right. understanding of, of the world and how you exist in it and those kinds of things. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, um, my personal professional opinion, I guess you could say would be, uh, you know, in the same way that, that someone who's going to experience ayahuasca, right. It's not something that you just do on a whim, right. It's something that you really think about, you prepare for, you go into oh, yeah. with a commitment to, um, to whatever's going to happen in that ceremony yeah, and a commitment to integrating whatever comes out of that ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the same thing goes for something like five MEO DMT, which really has equal power and, and potential to, to transform people's lives for, you know, for better or for worse. Yeah. I mean, I think what you said, like kind of relates back to where I'm, I'm going to relate it back to what we were talking about before about marginalized communities and people that are uh, underrepresented or maybe even the people that are suffering from great traumas that could make great use out of this thing be so much more, uh, it could be so much more uh, efficient and effective to uh, have this happen uh, for them rather than these eight hour long, three day mushroom ceremonies. So more accessibility, but the potential for more accessibility, right? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that's, you know, with an innate path is that we're able to do sessions that are two hours long. Um, and that allows for, and it also allows for processing to happen in, in smaller bites, right? We don't need to have this huge six hour long experience, which then requires many weeks of integration, yeah. In order to figure it out, I mean, we in that short amount of time, the integration is kind of weaved in, and you know, and that allows for the system to over the period of a week or two weeks, kind of get itself prepared to work on the next piece that's coming up. So I think, you know, five meo DMT. There's there's potential for it to be able to be used within a framework like that. Yeah. Sorry if my eyes were darting over there. I was just admiring your artwork. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, sitting here in Raphael's home, by the way, which is amazing, looking at his uh, Mexican patterned, um, what would you call that? Yeah, like a tapestry. Tapestry, a yes. Rug. Tapestry, yeah. In place of his the non-existent television, which is uh, what I have going on in my house as well. And I think this is the new trend to put tapestries in place of televisions. <laughs> I very much support that trend. <laughs> Tapestries in, in place of televisions and tryptamine in place of pharmaceuticals. I don't know. Um, <laughs> which is interesting because, you know, like I, I – I, uh, well, I guess what I'd want to ask you is since you run the Five Hive and – is it the Five Hive or is it just Five Hive? Five Hive. Okay. Yeah. Since you, you run Five Hive and uh, – you know, have written, co-authored this paper and are interested in, in this as a healing modality for people. Do you think, is this currently like the most interesting thing for you right now in terms of uh, psychedelics? Is, is there, are there other things that are really kind of piquing your interest and, and getting you excited? Well, in terms of the, the various psychedelics that can be used in therapy, I think 5-MeO-DMT excites me the most for, for the reasons that I described. But in terms of the, you know, what I would like to see more research cover is talking about the the therapeutic relationship. Like, how do we maximize the benefits of the psychedelic experiences? And how do we um, give more weight and more importance to the therapeutic 
alliance and the therapeutic relationship. Because I think that has been the biggest determinant um, of change for people is being able to heal in relationship, right? I think there's so many people who um, have taken psychedelics by themselves, like trying to heal and trying to get better. Yeah, right um, here. <laughs> yeah, right. And and there's still something missing, I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, that's why I filled out the form. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so there's that, there's something missing. Right? Yeah. And, and, you know, I, so in my work as a therapist at an A path, one of the things that, um, is really encouraged there is for the therapists to do this work for themselves, right? So working um, with therapists who are trained in that modality so that I know what it's like for my clients and that I've, you know, processed through my stuff. And what I noticed about this modality compared to, you know, taking psychedelics by yourself, trying to heal or, or going to ceremonies or something like that, is that the presence of another person that's there with you and is, um, you know, developing relationship is witnessing all the things that are there and that are present and that need to be felt. It completely changes the experience, like having another nervous system there. Mm, mm. Right. So, um, and I, I think most of the, things that get us stuck is the illusion that we're alone. And, and that illusion is so real and it's so easy to believe, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, if we believe it, it validates the pain that we've been through. Right. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the thing that's really like, uh, gets me feeling passionate is just, how can we educate more on the use of psychedelics in therapeutic settings, the use of psychedelics in relationship and putting emphasis back on the human connection and less on the drug, right? I mean, we already know that uh, psychedelics, you know, increase neural connections and, um, you know, encourage the brain to grow and, you know, have all kinds of physiological effects that are really good for depression, really good for anxiety, really good for, um, for perspective on life. But if we can start to also see the value of doing it in relationship and how that can actually enhance and help integrate these experiences into people going back into community, right? Right. Like, like if I heal in relationship, then now I have a new model for how to go out into the world and how to connect with other human beings. Right. Right. Like I don't, not only do I heal my personal trauma, the thing that I'm holding on to, but now I'm empowered to find those healthy connections that are going to keep taking me forward. Right. Yeah. And then that's, I mean, that's everything. I mean, that's how we start building a, a better world. Yeah. You know, it's and like that these, these people that are seeking, you know, healing can't do it in a vacuum because we don't live in a vacuum Yeah, we, and we psychedelics don't, we don't, don't exist in a vacuum. Yeah. We don't get wounded alone. We get wounded in relationship. We have to heal in relationship. And, um, and so, you know, and, uh, one of, if you look at indigenous cultures who use these uh, substances, these medicines, they, they're in community. They have community. They get it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they're not, you know, maybe for an initiation, right. They'll send the, someone into the jungle by themselves and they have to, you know, drink the medicine and right. Yeah. They go through their initiation, but they yeah. come right back Living to the, a, a hut. Yeah. yeah. They come isolation. right back to the tribe. Right? right. Right. You know, and the tribe is like, we know what you went through. Come on back. Yeah. Like you're part of us. Right. Like hero's journey. Right. Yeah. Right. Come on home. Yeah. Um, right. Like that's, we don't really have that here. Right. So we, we live in a more individualistic society 
And, you know, and I think that we have to start creating that, you know, community support, right? Yeah. Like that, that we are. We here. have to do it. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not happening from, the, it's not going to come from the top down. It's not going to be handed to us by the, the, the power establishment. Sure. It and, typically and, and, hasn't been throughout our history. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of like time and energy for healing, right? What our society has created is counseling and therapy, right? Like that, that's kind of what we have because a lot of people don't have time and energy to like, you know, wow, I've got nothing else to do. I'm just going to sit here and you're going to, you know, take mushrooms and we're going to work through all the stuff that's going on. I mean, you know, the, yeah, as long as I could be at work by 7am, <laughs> I got a big, I got these TPS reports I got to get in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Got to be efficient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I think, I think, uh, and that's not to take away from individual exploration or, um, you know, conscious uh, liberty, uh, sorry, cognitive liberty, um, or to take away from, you know, people being able to make decisions about what they want to do. But in, if we're talking specifically about, healing applications, right? Um, healing deep trauma. Those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm super fascinated by and really passionate about. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, and again, I'm not trying to, to diminish or take away from valuable experiences that people may have had in recreational settings or in their living room or whatever. Um, but just to say that, that, you know, do, going to those really deep places with someone who has clinical training, has experience working with those things, um, really creates a safe and reliable container totally. that allows for it to be integrated. It's yeah. I mean, I, I I've done it both ways, and uh, with somebody who's trained and and who's uh, well prepared to hold that space. It's like every fear, anxiety, it just kind of melts away. You know that you can let go and be accepted and and be held to a certain extent. And it's there's no, there's no greater feeling than that, than having that bond too, because that's 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 building that's building human connection, and that's what we need. That's what we desperately need. We're so disconnected. That's where a lot of these problems come from. And uh, you know, I it's my understanding that. The people that I was down living in the Amazon with the Shipibo, like they don't ha necessarily have in their culture the distinction between depression, anxiety, uh, paranoia, these different sorts of labels that we put on fear, which it's just a manifestation, prolonged, consistent, persistent, you know, chronic forms of of fear manifesting in different ways for people because we're trying to, you know, we're, we're trying to fit in to this rat park sort of scenario that we've got, you know, uh, this guy, like a lot, Christopher Ryan, uh, talks about how, you know, it's like, look, we live in a zoo. He's like, but, but you know, right now, because of the time that we live in, we can actually work to, choose what kind of zoo we live in. We can live in the San Diego zoo, which is beautiful. And, you know, I personally would l not like to live in a zoo. I want to abolish the zoo, break free and get out and be in the wild again. I don't know if that's necessarily realistic or not, but, or we could, or we could live in the Calcutta zoo, which is awful. And, you know, uh, so yeah, it's just, uh, I, I constantly think about this and I, I, I think about this, you know, trying to adjust to this framework that we currently have versus also trying to build a new framework. Uh, I think it's a little bit of both, right? Um, you know, I know we, we see a lot of kind of like psychedelics in uh, different media outlets, uh, stories being published about Silicon Valley microdosers and this whole thing. And I'd like to know how, you, how you, what you think about that. In my, and what I kind of think is like, well, we're not trying to take psychedelics so we could be 
and obviously I'm speaking for everyone, but I, I don't mean to, I'm just my, in my view, it's like, well, I don't necessarily think psychedelics, uh, are the, the point isn't to take them to be more efficient, productive, conformist, obedient workers to get work done and build apps and more technologies that will bring us to some place. Where are we going? What are we doing? What are, what are we building this for? What about the whole paradigm shift, you know, building a new model that's one of reciprocity and sustainability and connection and the things that we all, it's pretty simple. Eat, sleep, be in relationship, love, be loved. Do we need more? Maybe we don't need it, but we definitely do like to have guitars and bicycles and podcasts. So, you know, what's what's your take on, on this sort of um, commodification, I guess, of psychedelics? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's... I don't know if well, that'd be so accurate to say, but something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, so one of my friends, uh, David Nichols, well, you, you actually mentioned him earlier. Yeah, uh, love to get him on the podcast, by the way. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'll be happy to connect you two. Awesome. Um, I was actually talking to him earlier today. You know, he talks a lot about how, you know, the 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 so-called mainstreaming of psychedelics into our society is trying to apply capitalist values onto the psychedelic, right? And because the psychedelic isn't inherently anti-capitalist, the psychedelic is simply a tool that functions within whatever structure it's in. So uh, when we, you know, we see we're trying to integrate it into capitalism, you know, you're going to see people trying to use it to uh, enhance productivity, you know, more creativity. I mean, you hear about Google employees, you know, taking LSD, even not just in microdoses, but, you know, full doses, trying to come up with new ideas. Like, how do we program a new thing? And how do we... Yeah, new ways to mine your data. Yeah. New ways to mine your data, right? <laughs> so, um, so, and and to be fair, I mean, th- these kinds of things have been happening in every culture. Sure. So, I mean, we have, you look at, uh, you know, the, the Aztecs and the Mayans. I mean, they're pretty violent cultures. I mean, human sacrifice and, I mean, they were, they were terrible to their enemies. Right. So, psychedelics don't inherently create a world of peace. Right. It's, you know, they... They can. They can. Yeah. Um, they they can give us ideas on how to do that, but there's still work, a lot of work that needs to be done. And so I guess that to say, um, you know, microdoses may be uh, beneficial in some for some applications. You know, we have some research coming out about microdosing where, you know, um, you know they're. I guess they were saying like, you know, micro people who were taking microdoses have s- score higher on, on their wisdom, uh, and you know, less, you know, maybe some less neurotic traits or something like that. And so, you know, there may be utility for it. I, I think it, it probably won't be something that's may not be super useful as like a prescription, like take LSD once every three days or something. Mm-hmm. Um, Side effects may include, you're going <laughs> to, you want to quit this fucking job. <laughs> Stop following society's rules. Yeah. Uh, I, I think who knows, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's not uh, a clear direction for it. Um, you know, I, I, I would say like my, personal thought is like, yeah, I think I would, I'm also kind of against that capitalist slant on it. Um, and you know, microdosing is not, I don't think inherently bad, just like, I don't think any drug is inherently good or bad on how, based on how it's used. Right. Right, I mean, I, I think that every drug, just like any tool has utility in a certain environment or in a certain way. So, 
I, I know it's not a super clear answer. No, no, but... no. I get, I get it. And I think, and while you were talking, I was thinking about how my journey was one of like, I was doing stand-up comedy in New York. I started getting into libertarian philosophy, uh, quickly became an anarchist and had a very militant, fuck the government, burn it all down, abolish everything approach. Uh, then I had a profound LSD experience. So at the same time of my kind of like uh, anarchist beliefs were like merging with my psychedelic beliefs. And I'm like, well, maybe I should start this show. And, and I, and I definitely was very aggressive and militant about my thoughts and my beliefs. And now I think, you know, whereas I would have been like, this is bullshit. This isn't how, what the psychedelic experience is. But now I kind of see it in this just continuum, you know, it's like, look, there's people that are doing it and, th- and, and there's, People are going to do it in all kinds of different ways, but as long as we're, I'm doing it in a way that's true to me and putting that out there that I could at least speak for that and I can represent that, you know, and, you know, maybe it's not such a bad thing that we have these Silicon Valley, Google people doing these micro doses and that we have these kind of chic, trendy ayahuasca retreat things. Maybe it's a way to get into the culture. Maybe it's a way to seep in. I don't know. I'm, I'm just starting to be a little bit more accepting of that because I know how difficult it is to break into someone's reality tunnel with the kind of approach that we're talking about with psychedelics. Um, and then maybe, maybe that sets them on the path to diving deeper into a more serious, intentional, healthy, uh, respectful relationship. Maybe. Well, I, yeah, I would say the only thing with that, I think, is the importance of acknowledging the limitations and being honest about what this actually is. You know, I think that there's a lot of these, you know, some of these retreats who really don't have the qualifications to be doing like real healing work. I mean, you know, or, or facilitators who, you know, you're facilitating a drug experience, right? You're someone's taking a drug in your presence. You're keeping them safe, making sure nothing bad happens to them, but you're not really doing therapy, right? Like you're not, um, not necessarily creating like a, uh, you know, it may have aspects of healing, but, you know, I think so. It's important to, with that, to be acknowledging where are the limitations. Right. It's not, they're not. It's they're not these uh, comprehensive, all-encompassing healing modalities that are really uh, nose to tail inclusive in all of the needs that an individual might have right. when going to these depths. Right. And so I think that that you know. If there's anything that I would say is desirable or, or is left to be desired in a lot of these things is for there to be a bit more honesty for there, you know, like if it is like kind of a bougie retreat where it's more just kind of, you know, right? Like we're going to, it's this lavish res- resort setting and you're going to, you know, drink ayahuasca and it's going to be so beautiful and you know, do yoga every morning and it's more of a retreat setting. Great. You know, I mean, for someone who is, uh, well adjusted and, you know, uh, is in a good place and maybe they're just that they want to have this experience to kind of check in with themselves on how they're doing. And maybe they have a support network, right? Like friends and family that are all there for them. Um, you know, no problem. Right. But if you have someone who's got like some serious stuff to work through and there's not uh, enough clinical expertise in screening those people, you know, they might get into that retreat, have a really difficult experience, right. not have any support on the back end. Um, then you're causing harm. Or even that's the, the people that, sorry. And that's yeah. no. And, and that's just kind of the, the thing that I'm saying, like, you know, people having more honesty about like what they're actually providing. Right. Right. And then also just having that safety net there because you never know someone might apply, they might get into a place. They don't even know that they have something in the deepest recesses of their subconscious and the the depths of their psyche. They don't know that they have this trauma and that they've been carrying in their body uh, and it comes out 
And then how are you going to deal with that? Mm -hmm. You know, or the case of a spiritual emergency, um, you know, that happens. Uh, That's why I think in an ideal world, um, we don't have those kinds of retreats. We don't have people sure. who are unqualified doing Agreed. these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's where like, you know, I feel like very protective of people who are, you know, going, you know, who are desperate to feel relief from their depression or anxiety or whatever issues they're having. And they're reading all these things about, Oh, psychedelics can help. Um, and again, you know, this, this ties into where my passion is, where it's like, well, it's not so much the psychedelic as much as the, the connections that you have that are supporting the psychedelic experience. Um, and so that's where I would love to see more people understanding that like, yes, the psychedelic can be helpful, but more than the psychedelic being helpful, it's going to be the container for it. Right. That's going, you know, the container that continues with you, not just for three nights in the Peru, Peruvian rainforest, but yeah. also like, who's going to be with you when you go back home? Right. Right. Do you have a therapist who supports you? You know, like all those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, and like you said, if, if you don't have the clinical training, you know, you're not going to spot it. And, you know, and even more than that, there's a lot of people who might go into it not even having awareness of something coming up. Right. So Yeah, super important. Yeah. And my ideal world, we would, the container would be omnipresent. The container would be reality. Yeah. You know, that would be my ideal world, you know, where we would be living in a community. You'd be here, you know, we could like-minded people can get together and live in a sort of eco village and we can live our lives in ceremony, in ritual, in communion with each other in harmony with, with nature and with respect for, uh, for everything around us. That would be my ideal situation is, you know, to not have this sort of thing go away, but to just, but to be there as a, as an integral part of the human experience and, and an integral part of uh, shaping the best opportunities possi and possibilities for human health, happiness, prosperity, and, um, you know, fulfillment. And I, I think that in our culture, as we allow for individuals to heal, those individuals will begin to shift things back to a collective. Yeah. Yeah. Because those individuals can be outside of this illusion that we're separate. I mean, our, our culture is so focused on we are individuals. You know, I stand on my own two feet and I, you know, right? Right? Like sure. the independent man, the independent woman, the entrepreneur. Yeah. Right? Like I provide for myself and, you know you know, we, we exchange money for goods and, and it's very, you know, everything yeah. has to be like that. This is mine. This is yours. Right. Get off my lawn. Right. You boys hit this ball on my lawn. I'm keeping it next time. Right. <laughs> yeah. the, the scooter man, if you pass by scooting around with that loud thing one more time, you know? yeah, we're going to put it, we'll put a sign outside that says scooter man will be shot on site. It's like, Hey man, this is, this is our rules here. This is our property. Get, get off my property. Right. So, so I think that, you know, as, as in our culture, if we allow, if we give space to individuals, those individuals, um, can, can then start connecting with other people who are in the similar vein of like, we can create community. Yeah. There you right. Go. Yeah. Finding um, the others. Right. We're finding the others. We're creating community. We're creating inclusivity. We are giving voice to people who maybe have not had a chance to speak, we are, um, you know, and, and we're questioning the structures that are in place. And I think that creates gradual shifts. You know, I, I think who knows what's going to emerge, right? I mean, capitalism is one of the newest sort of inventions of, of man, a woman, humanity. Um, yeah, humanity. That's the word I want to use. <laughs> man, uh, man, woman, humanity. Man, man, um, but, w womanity. Yeah. yeah, womanity. Yeah, like it. So, 
I think um, who knows what, what will emerge. I, I think how incredible would it be to, to live in a global collectivist culture rather than this global capitalist culture. Yeah. Right. Like a, a, a global um, system, so to speak, that actually takes into consideration, you know, environmental impacts, societal impacts and so on. I mean, that would yeah. be, that would be beautiful. Like right? an, like a anti Illuminati, like a anti new world order. Yeah. Because you know, when you start, when you talk about these things, you can hear people saying like, well, that's, you know, that's, we don't want that. This is a gl- global hegemonic uh, regime ruling everything. It's like, well, no, because I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot uh, about a lot recently is this idea of like, well, all of these systems that we've created have been birthed out of a certain form of consciousness that has created them. Fear. Right. Yeah. This, this fear paradigm, this, this fear of the other fear of our own mortality which I think is a huge, a huge one, right? This book that I am in, uh, in love with, one of my favorite books of all time, Ernest Becker's The Denial of Death. It's, it's right there. Uh, down, down here. Yeah. Amazing. Right there. Yes. One of and, my and favorite books. If, if you like that book. Yes, I, I do. I enjoy it very much. Oh, wow. The Broken Connection, Robert J. Lif- Lifton. Lifton. Yeah. Author of Death in Life. So he takes Ernest Becker's work and takes it to a whole new level and, you know, looks at, you know, archetypes. Um, I mean, he, he, it's really amazing how he took Becker's work and just ran with it. But anyway. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Can I borrow that book? Sure. I need it back, though. Yo, I, I give things back. Okay. Yeah, I'm not one of these... Can I borrow something and never give it back people? I hate those people. In fact, I've, om- I've almost considered instituting a policy of I don't give things out because I've had things not returned to me. So I, I have too. So yeah. as long as you uh, promise to return in a time frame. Then. Yes, I, w- I will uh, do that. Well, um, yeah, that, that, that I think has been something. So I've been thinking about this new reality that can be birthed out of a new consciousness and, you know, the kind of resonance that that carries with it in order to form new systems. Like you said, capitalism has just been this kind of system that we, th- that we thought of and it's worked out pretty well for a certain period of time for certain people, but it's not the best thing. We don't know what the best thing is yet. Maybe we have some ideas. That's, that is the key phrase right there. We don't know what is the best. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. Right. We can only feel what is the best thing. Mm. That, I think, is the, the shift. Yeah. And by feeling the best thing, then we could come together with other people that match those feelings, and then we could start having a dialogue, even if we disagree, like you had mentioned before, because this, is, this has been something because that's then, been so then lost. if we disagree, right? Yeah. If we disagree, then the logic can serve the heart rather than the heart serving logic. Right. right. So if we get into a disagreement, right, maybe we feel differently, we can use our logic to find the common ground. Right. Whereas right now, if we think differently, it's just uh, an arena to the death, right? Like your idea must die. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where we find ourselves in today. Even, even in, you know, quote unquote, love and light uh, groups and people, there's still... Have you ever heard of hippie drama? Hippie drama. <laughs> Yeah. It's always, it's always there. Yeah, it's always there, you know? And, and so this level of discourse has eroded this level of intelligent dialogue and using the puzzle pieces of language that are coming out of the, my mind to collaborate with other people. But online, we see a lot of smacking down, smashing, you know, oh, this person got dominated or the you know, trolling or these sorts of things. But I also think it's just kind of a inevitable thing that happens when a new technology takes over. And now we live in this global world where we see everybody and we hear everybody. And um, it's a transition, right, to, like, get to the next point, next phase of where we can go and 
how we can get along. So it's kind of like this initial, oh, cool, we're all connected on the internet. We can all communicate and talk to each other. And it's great. You know, I remember the early days of the internet, like I was like maybe yeah, 11 yeah. years old and like going on AOL and being like, hey, dude, like, hey, man, like, I'm sitting in a chair. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this is so cool. We're talking over a computer. And that went into like, now we see ourselves in this kind of uh, just uh, weird landscape of uh, shouting matches online. And maybe we'll evolve past this into respectful discourse again, you know, where we can have intelligent discussions and we can say, oh, cool, you disagree with me? All right, well, I, I disagree with you. I'll tell you why. Uh, what do you think about that? Oh, I have a piece to that. Oh, wow, I never thought about it that way. Oh, interesting. Now that we're coming together, we can see the errors in this system and we can start to put things together in a way that works for everyone. Yeah. Well, and I think that it comes back to this idea that if – you know, if differing ideas don't equal threat, then um, then it becomes a lot easier to hear these other perspectives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If if a different if a different perspective is threatening to me, um, not right. Like when if people identify with their way of thinking, you know, anything that threatens that threatens, it feels like a personal threat. Yeah. Personal attack. Yeah. So, so I think that if, you know, if we can, again, like start to regulate again, um, interpersonally and, um, you know, yeah, I think just be open to being wrong and being open to, to sharing ideas and having curiosity again. Yeah, got to get rid of the fear. Man, this has been such a great podcast. We talked about so many awesome things and very important things. I want to ask you a question uh, that it's, it's interesting. Play along with me. You're going to die tomorrow. And, uh, you know, CNN grants you 20 minutes to go on national broadcasts uh, all over the, the world. And, and you get to say uh, something to, to people out in the world. And, uh, this is it, you know, you're going out, you got your time, you got, you know, you're going to go on TV. It's going to be broadcast to everybody. What are you, uh, what are you going to say? Well, I would say that the most valuable treasure that we can experience in this life is, to connect with another human being, to share love, to share compassion, to, to slow down and really see one another in the moment. And I think I would encourage people to do that as much as possible. Like, allow yourself to love and be loved. And I think that if there's one achievement that we could have in this life is for us to learn how to allow ourselves to be loved. How do we accept love? And, um, you know, I, I just don't, I think that beyond that, everything else is auxiliary, right? Like, you know, it doesn't matter how strong you are or how healthy your body is or how much money you have or uh, what achievements you've made and how many books you've published or papers you've written or debates you've won, um, you know, things that you've made. I think the one thing that that we get to have or, like, get to really measure our richness is just by the connections that we've made. Um, and if we can just share a moment of acceptance with one another, you know, I think that that's, that brings the most joy, right? Like to be able to, you know, either to forgive someone, to, uh, to listen to their perspective, to listen to what their life is like, um, and also, you know, to, to be in situations where you get to receive that too. I mean, I think that's, that's the best thing that you can have. And, you know, I've gotten, luckily I've gotten to experience a little bit of that in my life. I hope I get so much more 
And I wish for all people to get to have the experience of just being seen and, and being loved and finding community. Perfect. I thought you were going to end it again with another one word, one word mic drop like you did last time. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, that is, you know, talking about all these things that we're talking about in the podcast and all the things I talk about with all the guests in the podcast and really, you know, whatever, do you want to say it's cliche or whatever? I mean, it's true. It comes back to love. It comes back to love and being seen and, mm -hmm. and everything that you said. So thank you so much. Um, Raphael for um for for spending this time with me and and for sharing all this uh, this great uh information and wisdom um you're uh working with an eight path uh people here in uh in Colorado and Denver can come and see you uh they can go on the website uh, innatepath.org org and uh and you also have an Instagram account you do things so uh and you have five hives so uh, these are places where people go. Anything else, or is... um, yeah? I mean, you know, there's, other than that, I've just been working on various research projects with Five MEO DMT. So there's some cool research to read about there. And oh, your paper, yeah, well, several, yeah. There's great, yeah. yeah we'll so... put those in the show notes. Cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, yeah, that's the main thing. Just I think. I, I lately I've been super into Ram Dass, so oh great, you know his all his stuff. But I just love you know this idea that you know we're all just walking each other. We're home. all just walking each yeah. other home. Yeah. So, uh, so if you know we just all good old Rami. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's <laughs> like how Dass. could you how could you not vibe with that? <laughs> yeah. Love everyone and tell the truth. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's so many gems. But what a great spirit. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, we're, we're, we're ending now, but I, you know, it's just, it just hit me. It's just like, man, that's just one person. Look at all he's done. Yeah. Look at all he's created. You can do it. I can do it. Everybody out there listening has the capacity to do this. Everybody out there has the capacity to, to, to be love and to, to connect, accept love. Right. To connect yeah. and to, to get the healing that we all deserve, right? We all deserve to love and be loved. And if there's something in the way of that, you deserve to have the space to work it out. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Raphael, man, I love talking with you and uh, such a such a treat, such a pleasure. And uh, go and follow all of his work and, and read those papers, uh, just the depth of, of wisdom here. So. Um, check it out and uh, and I appreciate you for you know, teaching me and I'm still learning you know with uh, with 5MEO being, being so new to me and everything so thank you very much thanks everyone listening out there peace hey I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did hope you guys like these podcasts and enjoy them and if you do please Spread the podcast, share it, tell a neighbor, tell a coworker, tell a friend, tell a cat, tell a mouse, tell a dog, tell an ant, tell a firefly, tell whoever you tell, share it, spread it, like it, all that good stuff. If you owe, if you really love the show, you want to go a step further, you really want to help us out, leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts um, and go to patreon.com, patreon slash Mike Brank and um, patreon.com slash Mike Brank and you can donate as little as a dollar a month two dollars a month whatever you want help support the show that way as well but remember I love you guys no matter what you do I just love that you tune in and you enjoy these podcasts message me I like hearing feedback get in touch with me on Instagram Mike Adelic Podcast Mike Brank on Facebook as well and um, thanks to our sponsors Synchro and Hemp Bombs if you want a discount on ketogenic and plant-based nutrition products. Go to Synchro and type in the code uh, Mikeadelic at checkout to get 20% off. And they have amazing ketogenic chocolate fudge called Keto Mana that I have all the time because it's, it has like no sugar and carbs in it. So it's great. And, um, and it's delicious. And if you want CBD, uh, go to hempbombs.com and get 15% off all your CBD needs, I guess. And, uh, just enter the code Mike15 at checkout. But thank you once again to everybody. Thanks to Danny Barnett and Galaxia for the music, the intro and the outro. I love you all. Peace.